church, here we are remembering the significance of a very, very important day, what we know as Palm Sunday. We're going to be diving into a text in Matthew chapter 21. But the interesting thing about Palm Sunday is it's very easy to lose the significance in it because it just kind of becomes another day. I remember way back a long time ago, and when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to have lunch, not once, but twice, with a guy named Franco Harris. Now, I, may, I realize that many of you may not even remember or know what a Franco Harris is, but when I was growing up, he was a really, really big deal. It would be equal to Najee Harris, part of the Steelers now, or TJ Watt, or somebody like that that's really, really famous. Well, I had the opportunity to have lunch with Franco. I mean, it was like a really, really big deal. I got to sit with him and ask questions and, and have a conversation. It was really so cool because he didn't just become this, this person that I saw on TV or a member of the Steelers. It became personal to me. Now, I don't know if all of you know this, but the Immaculate Reception. That's right. What Franco Harris did uh, in, a, in a, one of the first playoff appearances of the Pittsburgh Steelers, I remember as a young boy hearing about this and then eventually watching it on television. This, this great, great catch. As a matter of fact, if you go to the Pittsburgh airport and you're walking through, there's a statue, there's a shrine to this, to this catch that Franco made and, and ran for a touchdown. And, and, and it was a huge, huge victory. But the problem is, is this, that many people go in and out of the airport and they just see this statue and it's like, mm, what's the big deal? Or even if you know it, you just kind of pass it because it becomes just normal. It just becomes, oh yeah, that's Franco Harris. That's what he did. So here's the big deal. Palm Sunday becomes like that. Something significant happened, but we kind of know about it. We're not sure about it. And we see it, but we don't know. And today, what I want to do for you and, and with you is together, let's rediscover the significance of Palm Sunday. Let's not just walk by it as a statue or a shrine. Let's really, really dig in. Let's really learn about this significance. So Palm Sunday, this is what it really is here. It's found in all four Gospels. It was the Sunday before the crucifixion, a very significant day. All four of the Gospels contain it. It's what we know as Passion Week. What is passion? I don't know if you realize this or not, but even if you look up the word passion in a secular dictionary, not just the Greek or the Hebrew or Christian dictionary, it speaks of the sufferings of Christ. That's right, intense emotions, sufferings. It actually refers to what happened with Jesus from the Last Supper actually to the crucifixion or actually when they took him down from the cross. This was really significant. And may Jesus' passion be our passion for people. I can't believe what Jesus did for you and what he did for me. And that's really what we're going to uncover here today. We're going to look at what this, this sacrifice is truly all about. So here it is. How are we going to rediscover the significance of Palm Sunday? This is what we're going to look at today. First of all, we're going to look at the significance of Passover, a significant day. Then we're going to look at the prophecy. Then we're going to look at the procession where Jesus actually came into Jerusalem. And there's three aspects to that. And then we're going to conclude with the passion of Christ. We're starting with the passion. We're going to end with the passion. Because this is all about Passion Week here. The passion of Christ. So listen, okay, here we are. We're going to start in Matthew 21, verse 1. We're going to read a couple verses. I'm going to stop and we're going to keep going here. So Matthew 21, verse 1, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage and the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you use them. So there's something significant happened here. They're entering Jerusalem. They were walking a long way, and here he says, okay, 
And it, really, one of the maybe the disciples, the apostles here, is like, really, what do you need a d- the donkey and a colt for? What do you really need this for? Well, Passover, let's just back up to there. It's a really significant, big, big deal. Passover actually goes back to actually Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12, 1 through 11. What it did was it was a, it was a, it was a way to remember God's deliverance of his people. They remembered God's deliverance and protection. Well, basically, they took the blood of a lamb and they put it on the doorpost of their home and death passed over the homes of those who had the blood of the lamb above their doorpost there. Now, the significance thing here is all Jewish males needed to be present in Jerusalem for this time. That's right. No matter where you lived as a Jewish male, you needed to go. Many would take their families, but as a male, you had to be there. So at this point, Passover is huge. I mean, in some, some commentators state that there could have been well over a million people in Jerusalem. Well, I don't know if it was over a million or a couple hundred thousand, but what we realize is this. We realized that it was a lot of people. That right. I mean, it was a huge amount of people that were in Jerusalem at this time here. And this is significant. It's, it's because God is lining up something very significant here. Now, it would have been customary that four days before, before Passover, before they would recognize that, they would be securing a lamb That's right, a physical lamb, because that's what they would would slay. That's what they would prepare for Passover here. Check this out. Four days before Passover is the Sunday here. That's what Palm Sunday. Jesus, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. So, as the Jewish people were trying to secure a lamb for Passover... The Lamb of God is coming into Jerusalem. The symbolism is as unreal because God is lining up something here. Now, did they realize that the Lamb of God is coming in just as they were trying to find the Lamb? I don't know. But just like you and me, we can miss the significance. We can miss the significance of everything happening in here. This is, this is so, so important that the blood is going to protect them here. See, there were three major feasts three major feasts it was passover the feast of weeks and the feast of tabernacles in which all the jews really got together for yes there were other ones those were the big three so i'm just again trying to point out the significance of passover the blood of the lamb you and i we still need the blood of the lamb jesus that was shed for us so that death separation from god will pass over us and we'll be protected and delivered by that by the lamb this is so so significant okay let's move on to the next point here we're going to keep going in the same text with the same verses here matthew chapter 21 4 and 5 this took place to fulfill the prophecy that said tell the people of jerusalem Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So, so significant here. That word humble. This is the way Jesus came in. And this is the way he did. It was unassuming, gentle, mild, and meek. What this was is this was fulfilling a prophecy. That's a fancy word that happened in the the Old Testament here, kind of part of the first two-thirds of the Bible as we know it. In Zechariah 9, chapter 9, verse 9, what this is doing is fulfilling that. This is that. This is the exact same quote. See, Jesus, and this gives us further evidence to believe that hundreds of years before Jesus came riding on this colt, It was prophesied and said. So there was a significant prophecy this was fulfilling here. Now, what about this donkey? What about this colt? A donkey, believe it or not, 
in the, in the Old Testament, it was customary for a king to ride a donkey, which means it would be bringing of peace. Me? Listen, I would choose a very strong war horse. That's, that would be in our natural thinking. That would be the way we would think. Why wouldn't Jesus ride a, a strong horse, a, a war horse, something that would be declaration of power? No, he came in humility. He came in gentleness with peace. So let's look at this cult. What a cult was in, in, in this text, it was the son of a donkey that, have, that has never been ridden. Very significant. Why? Because there's many occurrences in the Old Testament that a colt that was never ridden was used for sacred purposes. Do you see how this is all lining up? Even from early in the, in the Old Testament all the way through till now, we see the significance that, that, that Jesus fulfilled every last little detail. Why? To give you and I a great faith to give us a faith in God that's that's sound and has a good foundation attached to it that's what this was about doing so Jesus was communicating yes on Passover the lamb is coming okay and now he's communicating in the prophecy I'm doing something that you don't fully understand I'm doing something so deep and so significant. I'm fulfilling something that, that all things are pointing to this great, this great deal as a humble servant. That's what's so, so significant. Because see, the zealots, those who were looking for a Messiah that would come and overturn the government, a Messiah that would, that would, that would rescue them from Roman oppression and be a warring, victorious king, came in humility, came in peace, came on a colt. Now, why the donkey? Why the colt? And this is, the, the, so, some of the Gospels mention both animals and some only one. What we do possibly believe here, and what possibly could have been, is the colt would have needed the mom to bring peace, and so it wouldn't have been frightened along the way. But, I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe Zechariah 9.9 communicated it, and that's why we see it written out the way that we do here. There's no small things. Behold, our king, our king comes in peace to fulfill everything that the Old Testament is communicating. That's what's so significant here. That's what we're grabbing a hold of. A victorious king. Wow. But let me just pause here before I move on. I believe that there will be a day that Jesus will come on a white horse, a war horse. At the end of time, Jesus will be riding a horse and he will be, that there will be that moment. But this wasn't that moment. He came as a suffering, humble servant. That's what kind of king he is. That's what it is. So first we see Passover, the significance. Everybody's together here. The lamb being slain, death passing over, and then we see prophecy. We see everything lining up here. And now we're going to look at the procession. That's right, the procession of what happened. Three significant things. We're going to look at coats, outer garments. We're going to look at palm branches, where we get Palm Sunday. And we're going to look at the proclamation. Let's read in verses 6 through 8. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they threw their garments over the colt, and so Jesus would, would, would sit on them. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of them, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. This is where we get Palm Sunday here. A couple significant things happening here. In 2 Kings 9.13, it was customary that people would take, actually, uh, to, to pay homage to a king, they would take off their garment, their outer garment, their coats, and they would lay them on the road, and the king would walk over the garments as to like make a processional for, for that animal, the donkey, the colt in this case, to walk on here. So now, let's look at this. 
In biblical times, your outer garment was very, very significant. It wasn't just like you just went and you picked whatever you want at a, at a local store or a local department store or online as we do it. Your outer garment represented your, your state in life, your, your, your significance there. It could be your office or your social status. So, so in some cases, the kind of garment you wore, when people looked at it, they would know your social status. They would know your identity. Follow me here. I think this is really significant here. So the symbolism is, is they took off their outer garment and they laid it down. They, to, so so if it, what they were doing here was they were taking off their identity, their social status, and laying it down before the king. This is a huge deal. This is a huge deal. So if you and I want to make a way for Jesus, his glory to be seen, what we need to be able to do is this. Take off our identity and lay it down. An example of this would be somebody in the Bible, as we know, as blind Bartimaeus. In Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, there was this blind man, Bartimaeus, and he was yelling out for Jesus' help. And it, in, in verse 50, it says he took off his outer garment. When he shed off his outer garment, what he was saying is, I'm no longer a blind man. Because when people would see him, they would say, oh, that's the blind beggar. He's blind and he's a beggar. He took that identity off and he yelled for Jesus. If you and I want to make a place for Jesus in our lives, we have to be willing to shed our outer garment, shed our identity, shed our social status. For some of us right now, maybe we need to shed our self-sufficiency. I know with me, there's been several times in my life that I've been hurt, or maybe I've been walking in unforgiveness, and I had to willfully choose to take off that identity as a wounded victim and lay it down for Jesus so that his glory could be revealed. I don't know what your, your status is, but mine, I got to be willing to take it off. I got to be willing to take all those things off of being self-sufficient. Times I want to be self-sufficient. So I want to be, I want to do things on my own. And I have to be willing to take that off for the glory of God so that Jesus could have a way and his glory could be seen. That's what I face. I don't know what yours is. So they spread their coats out for him. The second thing we see in the procession is the palm branches. That's right, they cut down palms. Palm trees would have been very evident in their time here, and so they were cutting them down. Palm branches are a symbol of victory. We see them in the Old Testament in Leviticus, actually pertaining to the Feast of Booths, actually. But we also see them in Revelation. Actually, before the throne, people will be waving palm branches. So, so we see this. History, the only other time we see this is actually in in, in, in Maccabees, of all places, looking at history, what they did was they, they waved these branches here. It was, a, it was a symbol of victory, of goodness, of grandeur, of steadfastness. That's what it was here. And so, so this wasn't a, a new thing that they were doing. They would have seen this done before. And so to us, it feels like, oh, this was the first time it was done. No, this was common for a king garments, coats down, and now branches being laid down, branches being lifted up here. So significant. Now see, I remember Palm Sunday as a child, um, being, being in the church when everybody would, would, would get their palm leaves as you came into church that day and you'd lift them up. And, and even sometimes children would come down the center aisle with their palm leaves and, and, and the priest or maybe your pastor would bless them with holy water. That's, that's kind of my, my example of Palm Sunday. But unfortunately, I didn't understand the significance all those times. I just thought it was, hey, warning, warning, Easter's coming. You better get a new outfit for Easter. And it was just a warning for that. And we're missing all the significance of pointing to Jesus and his suffering and that he's a king and that with the lifting of the palm branches here. This is so, so huge here. So now let's look at the third part of the procession, which is the proclamation. The proclamation here found in verse 9, Matthew, we're still in Matthew 21. 
Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God, Hosanna for the son of David. Son of David, significant. This is the lineage of the king. That's what they were saying here. They recognized him as the Messiah. The king came from the lineage of David here. Blessings, blessings on the name of the Lord. Praise God, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That praise God literally means Hosanna here, which means save now. Hey, it means God save us. It, listen, I believe it, it, it wasn't so much a cry for help as it was a declaration or a proclamation of who Jesus is. Hey, he's the lineage of David here. Now, Psalm 118, 25 through 26, that's what they were communicating. The Bible is all connected here. That's what's so significant about Palm Sunday and, 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 and Passion Week and, and the resurrection as we're going to learn next week. It's all lining up and pointing to something here. It's a proclamation made six times in the New Testament. They were publicly acknowledging the Messiah. That's what they were doing here. So I want to ask you a question. Have you publicly recognized Jesus as the one who saves the one who saves us from hell, but not only saves us from hell, saves us from, the, from our own destruction, even in here and now. That's what's so significant here. That's what's so wild here. See, typically, they would have been singing the, several different psalms, or they could have been reciting them as well. It would have been Psalms 113 through 118. The, the, actually, those psalms, are all mentioned in a Seder feast, which, re, which is about the Passover, the story of Passover, the story of God here. And all those are mentioned in there. Even to this day, those Psalms are still in there. That's what they typically would have been doing at this time. So look what happens here in verse 10. The results of all this, the entire city of Jerusalem was in uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It would be similar to if we were outside of Heinz Field when the Steelers would score a touchdown. And there's a roar that happens inside the stadium. And you know something just happened. We missed it. We missed something happening. We need to find out what happened. Let's lean in. Let's look. Let's, let's go find out there. So you want to go to the nearest, you want to get your phone and check it. What, what, what did we miss? Or you, you run down to AT&T Sportnet right down by the river there and look at the TV screens to find it. That's what, how big this is that's happening here. Now listen, the significant thing here, they knew in Jerusalem, they knew a lot of people were coming. So they would be greeting people as they came in. And somebody of significance, somebody of importance, they knew they would all go out and they would sing louder and they would cheer louder. It would be as if a celebrity came and showed up somewhere. Everybody would be watching. Who is this? Who, who, who is this? I just spent time in California and, and every time that there's a big crowd around somewhere and everybody's running and looking, it's typically a celebrity. And, and, and I, I couldn't make my way in to find the celebrity. And, 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 and actually, the one time I did make my way through and I looked and I didn't even know who they were. So it wasn't a big deal to me. But see, they knew this was Jesus, the one who, who healed people's eyesight and raised Lazarus from the dead and did all these miracles. So they were going out to greet him. They were going out in a significant greeting here. But what they wanted was released from Roman control. What they weren't getting released from Roman control. They were getting released from the sin's control. That's what they were being released from. This is the significance of Palm Sunday. This is the deep, rich heritage of everything pointing to, this, to the son of David, this Jesus and, and, and can you imagine at this point, everybody's yelling. Could you imagine being one of the apostles walking alongside Jesus? He's on the colt and, and all of a sudden people are yelling and coats and palm leaves and this procession happened. It'd be like, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is why I follow Jesus. Hey, 
See, sometimes we don't realize that Jesus has a different agenda than ours. And I don't think many of the people there realized that there was expectations that they all had of Jesus right now. Many of those expectations weren't going to be met. But Jesus was going to make a way to heaven for you and me. That's the significance. The sufferings of Jesus here. They thought they knew him and they thought they knew his mission, but they didn't really. See, the same confusion exists today about Jesus. Many people want Jesus to release them of all their problems. And and he does promise us those things in the word of God. But he wants to release us from something so much more. Sin's power. This power of sin and death. That's what it is. Jesus, everything's pointing to this moment. Everything's pointing to the lamb that was shed. And when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, that's what's over the doorpost, if I can use this figuratively, of my heart, which means death, separation from God, will be no longer over me and on me here. Listen, it's not just, to, it's not just enough to acknowledge God and believe that something happened. But we believe in him. We believe in the significance that all this is pointing to here. Now, unfortunately, many of the people that were yelling, Hosanna, praise God to the son of David, to the king of kings, then yelled, crucify him several several days later. Let's not be those people. Let's recognize and prepare and make a way for him in this moment here. So we looked at the significance of Passover. We looked at the prophecy of how Jesus was the one to come, the Messiah to save us. And then we looked at the procession. But I want to look at something found in one of the other Gospels in Luke chapter 19. So, so significant here. And it's about the passion. Do you know what Jesus' passion was all about? You and me. It was about people. That's what's so significant here. Luke 19, as Jesus, as he came closer to Jerusalem and he saw the city ahead, he began to weep. He began to weep over Jerusalem. He says, how I wish today that you, of all people, would understand the way to peace. See, there were many people there saying, Son of God, but they didn't understand the way to peace, the way to have a peace of heart. But now it is too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Wow. During this Passion Week, may you and I together rediscover the passion of Jesus. Rediscover the significance of the suffering. Rediscover these intense emotions that Jesus didn't allow himself to get caught up in other people's praise because there was something so vital going on, so important happening, so significant that many of us can miss it. And I don't want you and I don't want me. I don't just want to walk by Palm Sunday this year. I want it to be engrafted in my heart here. For in him we find peace for our souls. That's what's so important here. That that, that Jesus was offering here. And 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 it's it's not too late for you and me. Will, Will we allow the passion of Christ to once again burn within us? Are we willing to lay down our social status? Are we willing to lay down our expectations of who we think Jesus should be? Are we willing to publicly declare Are we willing to make a way for his glory to be known for all people? We can do that if we allow his passion to burn in our hearts once again. Do we really know? Do you really know the passion of Christ? It's found in a relationship with God the Father through Jesus. That's right. According to the word of God, Jesus is the only way to the Father. That's right, the only way. He's not one of many, he's the only. In Palm Sunday, this grand day that kicks off this this most significant week, if there was ever a significant week in our lives as, as followers of Jesus, this is it here. So what I want you to do, and on your screen, there's gonna be a daily reading plan. Or may I also say to you that there's going to be... Um, 
Also post it on our social media site every day, a daily reading. I'm inviting you to once again read what happened on every day of the week leading up to the crucifixion and then the resurrection. I'm, I, so you're going to have those. Please take a picture of those or, 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 or get those in some way, some shape, some form. Get those in your heart because I'm going to read them. Will you read them with me? And then second, I'm inviting you to, to come and attend one of our four locations. Not only on Easter, but attend on, on one of these Sundays coming up. Actually, actually, come and be with us at one of our locations all over Pittsburgh here so we can, re- we, can, we can enjoy one another's worshiping Jesus together. But most importantly, what I want to ask you right now, has have you ever publicly declared Jesus in your life? In Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, it says if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's right. God, save us. Yeah, Jesus, save us. Save me from myself, Lord. Save me from hell, God. Don't just give me a ticket uh, to get out of hell. Redeem my life. I haven't just been rescued. I've been redeemed. And it says if we, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, Jesus, as forgiver of our past and leader to our future, then we can have a relationship with him. And that's what I want for you. That's what I have. And I want for everybody. And this is the big deal. This is what Palm Sunday t- turns to. So if you don't have any day or a time when you have openly declared Jesus as the only way to the Father, and He's the only way, that what He did on the cross is the only forgiveness of sins, and then you ask Him to now be the leader of your life, the leader, the one in charge, this book determines how we live then, then I want to invite you right now to do that, to make an open declaration. And if you're online, I want you to go right in the chat right now and say, I'm making an open declaration. And if you're watching and in one of the days not online, I want you to email us. Let us know that you're making an open declaration and you're praying this prayer. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, Hosanna, save me, deliver me. Forgive me of my sin. And then say, Jesus, lead me into my future. And I receive your peace. Peace in my soul. Peace that only comes from I've made peace with God, my Father. What Jesus did Passion Week for was for you and me. My friends, this is a big deal. May we rediscover and maybe in some cases discover the significance of Palm Sunday and Passion Week once again. Hey, thank you so much for spending this time with me. This has been so significant. And I just want to say thank you for your love and support. Let's make this one of the best weeks ever. See you next Sunday.